Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Railroad Empires, how we're building them. Uh, tonight's episode is all about bench work. Um, going to just jump right in and cover some questions we had after the last episode. So here's where we're at. And this questions, uh, these questions are all for the panel. So you guys just jump in and answer them how you want. You guys all showed plan uh, layout plans. Would, would you say it's a must or is it worth it? Or can you just build it as you go along? <clears throat> From personal can. experience, I'd say oh, everybody uh, at once. <laughs> I think you can. Uh, you can just go at building it. It's all my my opinion would be: Do you have some grand vision that you want to accomplish, and that you're going to be, you know, are you going to be happy if it doesn't reach some vision you have in your mind for it? In my case, I had a vision, and I but I didn't design it in computer software. It took Robert to encourage me to do the legwork of putting it in software. And after that, I'm firmly a believer in having that plan. But but you don't have to. It also depends on how loose you're talking about. Mine is a very dense railroad. It's not necessarily large. It's only 15 by 15. But I'm putting a lot of railroad. In a, in a dense space. If you have a lot of open space and you can flex and move some of your space, then you don't have to be so constrained about your planning. I, I can answer on my side is that I had no knowledge of trains. I, I never had trains, uh, never rode a train, so I needed help to get started. So I did go with a plan and I really don't regret it. I, of course, I did do some modifications as I went along. But I mean, the main um, the main plan, if you want, hasn't been changed that much. For for me, um, I've got a very odd space, and I was playing on a fairly large railroad, so it would have been better if I did start out with a plan. But I tried to build just from my head, and things did not go the way I had seen it in my head uh, because I also rushed through it. Uh, so I've come back and, and since done a plan and there may be, we may see some changes in my railroad while we're doing this show and some changes in some of my bench work. So I'm thinking about redoing and moving some things around. Yeah. See, and for me, it's, 
I, I like to design my layout first before I actually start putting hammer to nail. Um, I usually spend probably six weeks or so really kind of hammering something home that I like. Um, one of the benefits to our group is that I have the ability to to show the, the nightly chat people what I'm working on and get some opinions, and, and that really has helped me out. So for me, it's it doesn't work out to just kind of go willy-nilly and just start building. All right, next question. When you say bigger is not necessarily better, but shouldn't it be more fun to have the most industries possible? You can cause clutter. And it, it, it really makes some of your track, if you make your track work really tight, if you've got too much, you're trying to squeeze into a certain size space. Uh, and that all also boils down to which would you rather do? Would you rather do operations between industries or are you rather watch trains just run? My view well, on that. I know on my side, like I said last week, is that, okay, I've got about 18 to 20 industries. And if I was to start over, I'd have less than that um, because, yeah, it is cluttered. And also, yes, it looks really nice to have all those industries and it creates a lot of operations. But now I realize that it's a bit too much. So um, I guess it depends on the type of operations you want to do. Yeah, I think it's a bit. I agree with that completely. What is your end goal? If you're doing, uh, you know, like Big Bill's layout, um, you know, his layout is meant to be dense from a track work and industry perspective. It's, you know, it's it's in New York and it's built around the railroad. Um, you know, that that's meant to be quite tight. In my railroad, for example, it's it's Appalachia, and Appalachia has a very high. This is the the kind of the phrase that I think suits my thinking about this best is the track to scenery ratio. And if modeling Appalachia, I needed a high scenery to track proportion. While I wanted a lot of railroad, I still wanted that high proportionality, which is what basically forced me into a multi-deck consideration was to get enough track and not have a spaghetti bowl. Yeah, for me, I, I kind of look at it like two questions, right? So how much space do you have? And how many people do you plan on having over to operate me personally i don't have a lot of space um and i don't really know any people locally that would want to just come over and operate so for me i'm planning on one or two just for me to mess around with but for the most part it's just going to be uh rail fanning my layout which your layout will be quite operational uh, i mean of course it's good to rail fan i want to be able to rail, rail fan about as well but of course, I've looked at your track plan quite a bit as you've worked and developed it. That's an entire that will be an entirely enjoyable railroad for for you to operate individually or even two or three other buddies with you. Yeah. And see, I enjoy uh, yard operations more than actual like industry operations. So for me, having a large yard kind of fits that bill because I can go in and, you know, make up a train and let it run around the layout a couple of times, bring it in, switch it out, do it again. You know, that's where that's where I like to sit. Um but everybody's different, and really, there's no wrong way to do it as long as you're doing it. And mine has no yard because I don't enjoy the yard operations. I like the main line operations, the helper district, the industry work. You know, you've got to. That's why every railroad, every railroad, I don't care how much you follow some else's plan or what have you, every railroad will be different because every railroader is different. All right. And last question, real quick. Let's see if we can hammer this part home. Do you guys have any specific criteria before designing your layouts? I did a lot. You want to uh, elaborate a little bit? Well, I mean, of course, I'm modeling, uh, you know, very close to the prototype. I think most people have heard me talk about that. I mean, I make some compromises, but but the thing I knew that given the space, a yard would have taken the entirety of the space. And what I wanted was the man and machine together pitted against nature experience. That is what railroading in Appalachia is about. So I wanted a helper district. I wanted some really tight and, and, and tricky uh, grades to contend with and some really tight valleys with coal loading facilities in them. And, you know, to do that, I had to make sacrifices. Like I can't model all the way to the yard like I would love to. Um, I have to model 
you know, trades come out of the layout, they do the work they would over the section of the road and they go off without you, you know, the trades don't begin or actually end their run in a prototypical sense on the layout. On my side, uh, like I said, since I didn't know anything about trains, all I did was give uh, build a track planner. My, uh, the space I had, 40 feet by 20 feet, I told him I want a double main line so I can run a, a passenger train nonstop and the other track to do operation. And that was it. Um, yeah, that was it for me. For, for me, it was, uh, I had a couple key industries I wanted to do. I had my, my grain silo that I've scratch built and I wanted that on my layout and, it, and I scratch building a engine repair facility. I want that on my layout. Uh, I wanted a power plant and, and substations and stuff like that. Um, and I'm modeling more of a Midwestern area. So space is going to be wide and, and, you know, industries are going to be spread out. Even in towns are going to be spread out. They're not going to necessarily be stacked on top of each other unless you're in bigger cities. And so that's where I went and, and, and go, trying to go with my layout. I'm going to have long, broad scenery runs where you're just going through like rolling hills or, or flat ground you know, cornfields in the background and stuff like that. So I can also run long trains because to me running five, 10, 15 cars is not a train. Me either. You know, I agree. The, the closest I can get to replicating with scale models, you know, roughly to what I consider a full train is about 50, 60 cars. And I want to be able to run that. I can't run that in a, you know, condensed layout. See, yeah. for me, um, I didn't really have any major considerations, I would guess. Um, the only thing I really knew is I wanted a, a separate main line. Then, um, like, through my yard, I've got a separate line that doesn't even touch any yard track. Um, the other thing I was thinking about was uh, my brain just fried off. <laughs> The amount of space I had to use. You know, those are my only two big things. I wanted a yard. I wanted separated tracks so that I can just run trains through. Um, but that's really it. Well, and to add to that, I, and I, I've said this before as well. I think of being a layout builder, not necessarily a model railroader necessarily. If you're a structure builder or dioramas or whatever, you have different considerations. I think of being a layout builder, building your empire as like those old choose your adventure books or novels that we read as kids or some of us did. That I think of building a layout as a choose your own compromise. You're going to compromise where you compromise kind of defines what your layout's going to end up like. You know, if you sacrifice trade length and that's the compromise that you're willing to take, then, then fine. Then that that's going to affect what your layout looks and feels like. Or if you sacrifice curve radii or if you sacrifice complexity, we're going to make compromises. And which compromise you're comfortable with, because you're going to make one of them one way or the other, whichever one you're comfortable with is going to kind of set the stage for your for your layout. All right. Well, Tim, let's go ahead and get this, uh, this started off with you, buddy. All right. Um. Uh... My bench work is roughly 33 inches off the, the floor, um, 36 if you count the two inches of foam. Um, I've got two by two legs. My, you know, say, let me start a screen share here. Uh, bench work is box frame construction with just a straight foam on top. Wow, that didn't work. Uh, so, and then I've, I've added in the, the corners to cut, be able to round everything off. And event, preferably the way my layout would have went here, and that's where I'm going to probably change my bench work, is it would have wrapped back around this wall, standing up right here and i got in a hurry and i wanted to get some trains running so i went ahead and made made it a full loop and i did not go the direction i wanted to go and so that's gonna change now that i got the the track plan built uh 
it's all one by three construction with the the two by two legs in the bottom of the two by two legs are t-nuts if you're not familiar with a, a t-nut is um, i've got some here t-nuts are these little nuts that they actually you drill a hole in the bottom of your your leg and you just hammer these in and they got little paws on the bottom of them that grab the wood and you can screw a carriage bolt into them and have an adjuster for your leg height and that because my floor up here in the attic is so unlevel i had to have a way to level the layout uh, The tools that I used were a table saw, a circular saw, hot wire foam cutter for the foam, a compound miter saw. I've got jigsaws. I use framing squares, speed square, measuring tapes, uh, yard sticks for setting out the, the track on the bench work, which that's going to be in another episode. Uh, Screw guns, drills, countersink bits so I can get all my screw heads flush or past flush. Torpedo levels. And the, the such. Uh, but the biggest, biggest main use tool that I had was the uh, compound miter saw for cutting all my bench work. And I've got some square corner clamps, uh, spring clamps, and squeeze clamps. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to uh, cover on it. It each one, each section of my layout's roughly a four foot by two foot module. Um, so if I ever have to move, I can go through with a cut off wheel and just cut my track at the sections unscrew the screws that join the modules together and carry them off down that was the whole plan since we rent was that my layout would be movable when and if i have to move so that has caused me caused me some headache because this room is not square it's not level and with the walls not being square or and some of them not being straight that has caused some issues with trying to do some of my scenery and i wish i had checked some of that beforehand to make sure the the walls were straight the paneling was flat didn't sink, sink in uh, or just mounted everything straight to the wall But I wanted to go with something more more movable, which the modules allow me to do. Uh, hey Tim, I got a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> on on your screen right there, I noticed you got a hole for your wires. Have you pre-drilled all your cross beams or did you just drill them as you go along? I drilled them as I went along. Because I didn't know where everything was actually going to land. But once I started putting in the modules and found out the room wasn't square perfectly, I was having to adjust certain things. And they're actually running roughly straight under my track so I can just drop my feeders down. So as my track went around the layout, because and this is because I was building by the seat of my pants to start with, I had to know where my track was going to be at to know where I wanted to run my feeders. Lloyd, do we see any uh, questions in the chat? No, there's no questions. Um, no, no, none. All right. Well, Tim, if you're if you're set, then I'll go ahead and take over. Yeah, I'm set. So it's on to you, Robert. All right, buddy. 
So I was kind of approaching today with the idea of uh, having a couple of cameras set up here to show you guys um, all the different tools I, I used in building mine. <clears throat> but that's why I'm in here with the, with the as a guest on my iPad. So I can go ahead and show this stuff now. Uh, so I used... I actually use three different types of circular saw while building my layout. Um, the Ryobi you see there was the, was the most recent addition. Um, that was super helpful and handy in uh, cutting backdrops. The the work saw, the, the small worm gear, I actually used that quite a bit when I was cutting um, different pieces of the bench work. A lot of people generally will uh, use multiple drills when I did mine, and I'll show you pictures later, but I used three different drills for mine. So I had one set up with a drill bit. I had another one set up with a screw head. And I had the third one set up with a Forstner bit because I was I was uh, sinking holes for my screws so I could they would sit seriously flush or, or under flush. Another tool that I got that really helped out with the corners of the bench work and making sure they were square was this uh, bench top square. It's got uh, clamps to clamp it to your work. And then this part here actually opens up and lets you adjust it. It was nice for being able to uh, glue it and screw it and drill it and everything else you got to do. Uh, I used a couple of different sizes of levels, uh, torpedo levels, a couple of different sizes of bar clamps, a couple of sizes of C clamps. Um, I did use Gorilla Glue and screws when I did mine. Uh, that's wood glue. Um, so basically uh, really what you see is, is variations in different sizes on the stuff you're, you're building. Um, I used, uh, rafter squares, a smaller rafter square, uh, uh, speed square, uh, drills, hammers, regular general purpose screws. You don't really need to get something super long or super, super expensive for this. Those general screws work really good. I got them at Home Depot. I think the box of it maybe cost me like eight, nine bucks. Um, however, in building this monstrosity of mine, I have gone through about three boxes so far. Um, I got a really, tool, a really cool tool for Christmas uh, that has kind of helped out. So this, this is a Craig sled. So it lets me set it up, and it does it doesn't move very much, if at all, when it's on top of something. But it allows me to get a nice straight line. Um, this part does come off. This the saw sits and attaches directly to that. So that was nice and helpful. And then, of course, the good old chop saw. Um, can't go wrong with that. Makes it easier for when you're doing massive amounts of cuts and crazy things like that, and you can just go through and hit them all real quick. Um, I'm a tool guy. I like tools. I've always been a fan of tools. Uh, let me see what else we got here. So I've also got some photos um, to share with you guys. So I'm going to jump over, switch cameras real quick. Uh, give me two seconds here. Where'd that folder go? Yeah. Yeah, I really like well, my... Well, I had some uh, photos for you. I really like my compound sliding miter saw as a chop saw because it allows me to cut, you know, wider boards than normal. Uh, and I got it on a fairly decent price at you know Black Friday deal. So if you don't have a lot of money to buy the tools, wait until around Thanksgiving and check out Lowe's and Home Depot because they'll be selling tools on some pretty deep discounts. Yeah, and see, when I got that, I just didn't have the money and, and whatnot to do that right away. But now that I'm now that I'm sitting all right. That might be the next big uh, tool buy I get is a compound saw. But now that I'm now that I'm sitting all right, 
Well, that might be the next big uh, tool buy I get is a well, compound te saw. Technically, yours is a compound yeah, saw from I'm what you're showing. All right. Well, that might be the next big uh, tool buy I get is a well, compound saw. Well, technically, yours is a compound saw from what you're showing. Yeah. Sorry, somehow I unmuted YouTube. Uh, because what you were showing, Robert, that thing does uh, forty-five up to forty-five degrees sideways, and you can lay it over, right? And chop, lay it over at a forty-five degree angle. Yeah, or slightly more. You could well, and so you have a a miter saw is you know can turn forty-five degrees. A compound can also turn this so, way. Yeah. I like my like, double compound. You can go both ways. Uh, that that and that, see, that's the only difference between mine and a, a actual compound saw is mine has to slide. So not only can I I cut it down, but I can also pull the blade towards me, or I can shove it, you know, back. Yeah, yeah, that and that's super helpful with cutting bigger things. So this here was my first big Home Depot buy once I got established in this house. Um, that was really kind of fun and exciting to have the Home Depot. It's sideways. I, I wish I could rotate it for you, and it won't let me. Um, really? That was really exciting to get that in here. I was really super excited. So once I got it broken down, this is what it all turned into. So what you're looking at is uh, one by twos, one by fours, and two by twos. I used the two by twos for the legs. Everything else was used for, for the actual construction of the bench work. Again, stupid sideways downloads. I don't understand this thing. So this is just building me building the uh, the outside frame. Well, there's my little chop saw there. Like that, I just chopped a lot of wood for this one. You took those pictures on your phone, didn't you, Robert? <laughs> yeah, I did. You turned your phone sideways. Something. I don't know what I did, but it. it I, I re-downloaded these off of uh, off of my uh, my Google Photos. In Google Photos, it shows up right, but when it downloaded, it downloaded it sideways, and it won't let me twist them. So, kind of just have to make it work. So, I did a box frame uh, construction on mine. My last layout, my last two layouts, one was a uh, shelf. The first, the second one was a shelf layout, and I used the uh, closet made system. So it had the the graded shelves and everything like that. Uh, it was kind of cool. It took me that one took me all of uh, you know like a day to put up. Um, my first layout was a was a eight, basically an eight by eight or two four by eights put together. Um, that was built out of two by fours and four by fours. Oh, um, heavy! Oh, it was. Geez, man, it was super heavy. Um, I'll never do that again. I, that was ridiculous. Um, but I will say this: the plywood you see here in this photo that came off of the original layout. The uh, the foam, the painted foam you see here. That came off of the second layout. So I, I've carried parts of parts of each of the layout into this one here. Um, and I do plan on using some of that foam for the second layout in in building this layout here. So when I was putting I did it, I, I built my first mod my first section. Uh, I kind of want to call it a module, but it really wasn't a module. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of proof of concept it. So I built one from start to pretty well finished. Um, and what I was able to do here was with, with that little works, um, worm drive saw, I was able to cut this notch out so that my, my, uh, backdrop board would fit right in there nice and neat and clean. Um, here's what it looks like when it's sitting upright. So again, proof of concept, right? I'm not going to put a full sheet in there, full size sheet in there. So I just, this is what I had sitting here from the last layout. So I went ahead and just tested it out there. We held it up with some clamps, worked out pretty good. Uh, so then I started building legs on this thing. And uh, I knew that I wanted to have my supports notched into my leg posts, not just sitting on top or resting on top. So uh, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit, show you how I did that and then we'll go back. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you how you did that, whether you bought a dado blade or no, I did not buy a dado blade. I went old school. So I used that that saw, that work saw. I just cut out a bunch of, of lines right in between the two spots where I knew I wanted that board to rest. And then once I got that done, I used a chisel and I knocked them out of there and kind of cleaned it up a little bit. Um, and that lets that, that lets that supporting brace here sit flush, if not a slightly uh, slightly lower than flush in the pocket. 
Um, I, I'm pretty well happy to say that none of them are really sitting proud. They're all sitting pretty well right, if not below that line. I use the same technique here on this back cross brace. So what I did there was I basically took my my uh, one by two, divided it in half, and then at that depth, I just cut both boards in the right spots um, and chiseled it out and put in a drop of glue and, and hard press those together. I didn't actually use screws on that cross brace, but that wood glue I use is Gorilla Brand, so I know that's going to hold really, really well. Um, so I wasn't overly worried about it. I did uh, use a C-clamp to really put some pressure on it to make sure it gets and got a nice tight bond, though. Um, and then I started putting – so I got I had my proof of concept already. So then I started putting legs on. And as you can see here, they've all got cross braces um, in the backs and all got leg braces on the sides. Um, I did leave the fronts open because I'm planning on putting in some sort of shelving or something else like that underneath the layout so that I have a little bit more space to work with. Um, so I wanted to leave that open. There is a couple of spots like right here in the corners where that, that opening is basically cut in half. So it's a little tight, but you got you got to do it what you can. Right. Um, got, got all the backdrops up, all the backdrop supports up. I even started putting valances on, um, because I knew I was going to have, I, I, I knew I was going for a shadow box type effect. Um, my plan there is to paint the paint the fascia and the on the valance and the fascia on the layout black, so that your your whole eye focus is right there in the in the modeling space. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at. The second one I got was uh, the second shipment I got was kind of awesome too. It was uh, a big old stack of the the foam. That was fun. Oh, it was also the the Mace Knight too. We got any questions in the chat, Andy? What's, what's yeah? There's some comments back and forth talking about the saws per se, but I haven't. I don't see any yet for you. Anybody has any questions? We could always come back to any uh, anyone else that that has already spoke if you're interested. So please, any questions you have about how he's put this together or how in the world he got those stacks of wood to hang to the wall like that? Because I'm curious myself. Got <laughs> <laughs> that gorilla glue, Andy. Well, possibly. Yeah, it is, good. I mean, it is good the glue, West man. Coast. It is the West Coast. I'm not exactly sure how gravity works out there, but um... <laughs> it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky. Sometimes it sometimes it goes left, sometimes it goes right. You know, you just kind of have to make it work. Well, you've got some interesting tools. That Craig, um, what do they call those? A track, Craig track. Yeah, uh, whatever. I, yeah, that is it's, yeah, it's a track system. Dude, that thing. I'm, so here's the thing, um, and I, I learned this the hard way. So with this this Craig tracks, all right, you're gonna get you get two pieces of track um, in the kit. Well, if you want to cut a four by eight sheet and you want to make that eight foot cut. You actually need two kits because you have really? to get the length. Otherwise, you're yeah. Otherwise, it cuts short and you have to move it. So do uh, they lock really? together to make what eight foot piece? They lock together. To make yeah, they do. Foot. Yeah, I think it, I think by the time the tracks all put together, because it's got end caps on it and stuff. I think once the uh, once the, the just the track itself is there, I think it boils down to about seven seven feet or so. Um, and I actually got three kits so I can make, I can make super long cuts, but I can also kind of show you from here. So I don't know how well it shows up. Tell me if you can see the back of this thing, Andy. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, and it has that, with that little blue thing on the end that, you know, the Craig color thing. Yeah. That's how and that, so this butts up. So right here, this butts up to your, to your material. Right, and then you run from there. So I mean, it really cuts off a good six, seven inches or so. But these these track pieces are only this long, right? Huh. They're maybe maybe two feet, two and a half feet, or something like that. But what they did was they've got they've got metal slides in here that you basically just tighten down to lengthen this thing out. And it'll work with effectively any skill saw, right? They don't have. I mean, well, I mean that standard yeah. base, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, it's got a standard sled. 
um, that you can just mount any circular saw into. Oh, I see how that um, works. That was what confused me. So they provide a sled that it sets in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and then here's the other thing. So it, as you start building, um, you basically get a sled with every one you, with every set you buy. So I've got three of them. These are the sleds. Wow. So you set your saw, you're basically, your saw sits up in here and then, and then it runs on the track is here. So you got to so be when offset, you're running it. You got to be offset a few inches. Don't yeah. You? Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be a see, see, see the gap here. That's where your blade's going to sit. This will adjust out a little bit um, to give you for the width of your guard. These two pieces fold down and clamp down to the, to the, uh, bottom of the blade and then this whole thing just kind of locks everything in place so then once you've got it set up then you just you turn your saw on you just slide right up the track see i use it's basically I train use, tracks for a circular saw i just use a just a, a, a straight two by four for making long cuts just clamp it down at each end and then you know put your saw up against it um uh, and they also make this tool uh pick it up at harbor freight it's the same thing, basically. It's just doing a two by four, but it's made out of aluminum. It's about four, get about four foot usable length on it. And but it doesn't have an angle on it, so it, it needs some more strength. See, the problem with like a two by four, which is not so bad, but is that they have a little bit of flex to them. So if you're putting some pressure on it, but if it has an angle, huh? That's a neat little trick. So that's basically a, it's like a guide. Um, yeah. I use a four foot straight edge or a T level. Um, quite a bit for making four foot cuts, but I wouldn't want to make eight foot cuts with it because it has so much play in it. Whereas that Craig kit, I assume it's it doesn't have much. Uh, obviously, shouldn't have any play. There you go. No, it it really it really has it has no play whatsoever in the sled. So I mean that it keeps you on that on that plane that you're trying to hit. Um, I've tried doing the two by four thing and and you know figuring all of that out. And it just. I, my brain doesn't work that way. Apparently I couldn't get it to ever work. And every time I tried it, I'd come up with a weird zigzag in the cut I was trying to make. But like I said earlier, I like tools. Um, and this kind of stuff really just kind of hits that button for me. So, I mean, I should show you one of these times while we're on a different show or a different chat, I'll uh, show you the Christmas presents from that year. It was pretty much all Craig. It was awesome. Hey, we're all gearheads for the most part. We all tend to probably fall down, <coughs> that, you know, fall down that path of whatever it is that justifies buying a new tool. I'm always happy when I get to buy a new tool. I'll tell you what, though, this the speed square here very, very rarely left my side when I was doing all the cuts for this bench work. I use this thing more than any other tool. Huh? I love that. I love that speed square. Yeah, speed squares are, are great tools to have. Yeah, so, you, so uh, and I don't know if y'all know how to. I mean, I know you guys here in the in the panel do, but you know, some people out in the chat may not be aware of how a speed square works. So, just real quick, like, so I draw a, I draw out my tape measure to how the length I want. I make a little mark at the top, and then I drop this edge right there on that, so that this line here runs right across the surface I want. Hit my mark. There it is. I'm ready to go. It's zoop, done. Don't even have to think about it. And it gives me – it's a nice square line, too. It's not going to be angled one way or the other. Just done. Good. And I was, I was talking about the speed square, <laughs> suggested that whether it was around or not. Stanley made that thing that got called a speed square. I don't know if Stanley still makes it, but I know there's knockoffs that are still making the equivalent of the same tool. Lloyd? This is a yes, Swanson speed square. Running out. We still have two more people to go. So, uh, you want to jump in, Andy? Yeah, if there's no more questions for Robert, I'll take nope. my turn. That's so, it. as any of you guys know that have seen my layout, and I pulled one of the modules down that I've been working on recently, and, and I'm going to put it up after I'm not in front of the camera in a minute while uh, while Lloyd's covering his in a minute. So, you'll probably get to see me, uh, you know, fall off the ladder and, uh, you know, just somebody called out one wood. Um, so, I does not have a traditional wood bench work. Now, I have a lot of wood tools. Um, I grew up a carpenter's son, which basically meant I was somewhat a carpenter. And I even run a construction business, a modeling business, with five employees uh, during the dot-com turned down in the early 2000s. Uh, got a really nice Hitachi 
uh, double compound sliding miter saw. I've got air tools. Even got some of the pass load fuel cell impulse gun steel. I'm fully comfortable working with wood. What my problem was is, is especially when I started this uh, railroad about five years ago, I was working and I still work quite a bit, but I was working ridiculous numbers of hours and I really wanted to play. So I built the first module thinking that I would go back and put it on top of wood framework that it would be required. But when I built the first module and laminated the layers of styrofoam together, the little three foot module that I built, it was completely rigid. Uh, it was, you know, maybe not as rigid as the gator board that I've been using recently uh, for the top level, but it was as solid as I could ask for. So instead of building bench work or building framework, I basically build scenery. And it just so happens that, that that scenic element produces enough structural strength to hold it up. I mean, my entire layout all around the room is better. Now, what I have become an expert on that's very similar to, um, to bench work is on the brackets that hold mine up. So first is that I do have to spread some of the gaps. I don't want to design my where my layout breaks, where the modules break and, and make joints at. I don't want to design the points where it breaks. Here's, you know, off camera slightly, but here's here's one of the breaks. I'll eventually seal all these in completely and cover the fascia with styrene. Um, once I'm sure, I don't have to take any more of them out. But I did want to design that around where a stud was in the wall. So a lot of times, actually quite a bit of it, is now supported or between the brackets, supported on aluminum, bars. Now, they're not exactly super strong. They even have some flexibility to them, but it lets me put my section joints at the most convenient point in the track work scheme. So, my modules are, uh, you know, six foot four inches and 36 inches and five foot four and wherever it made the most sense to break them. This break is between a uh, turnout that goes into a siding and before it hits into the curve. And I've made other broken sections, um, after it goes through the turnouts in the yard and is out in the four tracks and quote unquote yard, as Ralph was saying, I do actually have somewhat of a yard on my lad. It's just not a classification yard. It's just a couple interchange tracks that are, they would call it an interchange yard, but that's using that the term yard very loosely. But I use a uh, aluminum L channels, uh, normally the one inch stuff. Uh, if I need more strength, I'll use the eighth inch uh, thickness, whatever gauge that turns out to be. They sell it in thicknesses. Most of these are 16th inch. Also, something of interest is that I found that those worked really good for mounting my valets on. So this one, I have not put the valets on yet because I needed to play with the heights for the top level, especially here. This top level, and I'm going to turn my change cameras, but this top level is way up against the ceiling. The scenery runs right up into, right up into the ceiling where it won't even have a backdrop in, in, much of the sections over here that scenery runs right up into the ceiling there now granted those these modules are above eye level obviously they're the track work there is at about 80 or 82 inches um on another section where the where the track work where the where there's a bridge that goes across the aisle I just have to show you in a second. Where the track work goes across the aisle at one point, I thought I would just go ahead and expose the bridge and not have scenery under it. It goes across the aisle at 84 inches in the air on a steel viaduct trestle. And there you see there's a module or a break in the module in the corner at a slight angle so that the break in the track work is perpendicular to the rails. So I don't have to run the, you know, you're not making a joint uh, along an angle and trying to make the you know cut the rails at an angle or something but the the brackets is what i've really spent a lot of time dealing with especially on a multi-level consideration so on the lower level where i don't have to contend with um you know where i don't mind the kickback and where they are two foot thick i've used these fairly heavy duty brackets now these are not the cheapest as far as brackets go but they're, they're quite solid and they have this kickback and they'll support the two foot deep modules. These are about 22 inches deep, giving me enough room for my skirting. And I put a little, kind of a little valance uh, along the edge to hide the top edge of the skirting. I put a, a one inch strip of foam core painted black um, and glued up to the module with a little strip of, of wood behind it to cover the meeting behind the, between the skirting. And I step it back under the layout a couple inches. With my layout being up at eye level, uh, me or anybody near my height, you know, so basically, you know, basically any dwarves, 
out there can walk around with the layout, you know, having as much room under the layout to swing your arms. And while the aisles are 26 inches wide, it doesn't feel constrained because for anybody sub six foot or anybody other than Shaquille O'Neal, when you walk around through the layout, it's basically a layout that fills the entire room that has a 26 inch wide slit in the layout for your head to walk through because the layout's so high. I've also used these others that are quite a bit smaller, effectively the same thing. This is, this is what's holding up much of the staging. But I also take advantage of the kickback and the staging that is under this level. I've actually uh, used staging boards, mostly one by material, that runs out. And I put a little slit or cut a little at an angle, cut a, a little slit that's perfectly tight to this. So when I put the bracket in there, it drops in real snugly on this and uses this as a support, allowing me to use a, very, a much smaller support elsewhere. However, on the top level, I did not want to have those kickbacks under it. Now, I have hid most of my brackets with with the um, with the backdrop. So I've used uh, aluminum trim coil. It comes on a roll um, 50 feet, or you can buy them longer than that. I believe this that I bought was, was 50 feet. But you'll see here the backdrop... On these modules, you can see the bracket sticking out from the top, and I've even thought about whether I would go back and put foam core on the bottom side, because I have to paint the bottom side white or blue anyway. I've even thought about putting styrene or uh, with some foam core between the brackets to hide them completely, but right now they don't bother me too bad. However, in a lot of other locations where I've needed more support, such as, sorry for the jittering, in other areas, like here where I'm working now, this I have to span across this window. And while behind this window will be covered with uh, the trim coil at some point instead of the foam core that I've got stuck in the models right now, I've got these much more rigid. Again, they're more expensive, etc. But these are these are tough as nails. These are quarter inch thick steel shelf brackets. I have these on either side and they support the aluminum channel and then the brackets on top. Now, because I can't get a tremendous amount of thickness on these modules, especially on the front edges uh, of laminations, to gain strength just by the scenery alone, and while the bottom levels are just styrofoam, setting on top of shelving brackets with some aluminum strips along the front edge, um, I have used the gator board. You guys have seen that on the build show, and I've talked about it on others. Uh, I've done a lot with it. It's not the cheapest stuff, and it's surely not the easiest stuff to come to, to get, but this allowed me to have a top deck and that's multi-deck, people building multi-deck layouts, the, one of the biggest debates is how can you get that deck thickness down? Because that's going to be one of the biggest controlling factors in how much visibility that you have between your levels. This let me get it down to one inch. So that covers the grand scheme of what I've got. If there's any questions about it, most of you guys have seen mine. Um, but I do have the aluminum L channel up top. The valance is in front of that. And I use the aluminum L channel also to mount my LED strip light again. But we may talk about that on a future show. Yeah, so far, Andy, I'm not seeing any uh, any questions right now. We can just jump right in with Lloyd. And if uh, something comes up, we can hit it here at the end of the show. Well, I've covered that a lot. People have seen, most of the community has seen uh, this big, grand experiment that could still totally fail. But it's been a big, grand experiment for me. So, all right, Tim. Or Lloyd, sorry. Lloyd, how are you doing yours? Uh, okay, so my layout is all built with one by fours, all of it. Um, and I use one and a half uh, floor screws, number eight. Uh, the type of construction is L girder. And the height of my, uh, my layout varies between 43 and 47 inches. So I don't know if you can see on the picture here. Like they're like um, brackets. So let me show you how I got started. Um, hope this works. Um, why am I not seeing? Hold on. I got that. So it's the entire screen, right? Yeah. But then you got to bring up your uh, picture viewer. Oh, I... 
Just hit hide. Oh, right. Hold on. Okay, now I got it. Can you see this? Okay, so what I did is I built my angles uh, to be able to screw them uh, against, like in the back, there, my two by fours every 16 inches. So I've got one bracket for every 16 inches that goes all around um, the room. So as you can see, I knew at here on the right hand side uh, that I I had uh, I have a river, so I knew that I could lower it. And in the middle, that was the start of my peninsula. Um, and like I said, everything is done on a one by four. The, the difficulty in all that was doing it all by myself. So you had nobody holding on to one end of the piece. And as you can see, uh, like all my, all the inside of the boxes are all <clears throat> 16 inches apart because I was going to put plywood on top. Uh, and the, the part that's sticking out, that's going to, that was going to be my backdrop. So everything is done one by four. Uh, the tools I use was mainly, um, there's a, uh, one of those saws that come down there with angles, miter saw. And I had a table saw. Um, my, uh, like Robert, I didn't have three drills, but I had two. One uh, pre-drilled the hole, and then um, the other drill had the, the screw bit on it. Um, I also have a helix. Uh, what I did is I pre-cut uh, a quarter of uh, the circle. My radius is 30 inside, 32 outside. So um, what I did is I, I put the piece of paper while my track plan <clears throat> on top of the plywood and just cut what I needed. And I was able to put, uh, I think it was eight or 10, Per, uh, per sheet. And of course, the assembling of the helix, what I did is I, I was doing my circles and I was, I was letting one end um, undone so I could just pile them up and we'll get to the road bed on another show. But uh, I have, I think I had four or five circles made And the, the joints were held by a piece of masonite, one eighth of an inch, and they were screwed in. And everything was going to be held by uh, blocks. So that's the base of my helix. The, the reason for the helix is that I had a staging area at the bottom. And the double track, because I had two entrances to the helix, one representing Ottawa and the other one Montreal, east and west. <clears throat> so as you can see, the helix was done here. And then I kept on working on my bench work for, um, for the, the left-hand side. As you can see at the back where the staging was starting right here. Um, I needed to build a wall between my office, well, my office, uh, my bench work, um, that's it, my bench work. So I had to build a wall and then you've got, again, you've got the staging that goes into a reverse loop and the top part is um, the, the main layout. Lloyd, I got a question on your, your heat, back on your helix there. How do you get in that in case you have a derail? Can, is there enough room underneath that for you to crawl up and crawl up through the center? Yep. Well, not really, but yes. Uh, all I have to do is once I finish this the floor piece that's missing, I'll be able to slide under and come out into the helix. Okay. Um, there's not much room, to be honest. It, like I just said in the last show, if I was to redo it, I would make sure the staging is, instead of being 24 inches from the floor, make it 36 inches. To have it to make it a little bit easier 
but uh, yeah, there's room right here to slide in. And it's at 60, it's not that easy. <laughs> so all my um, all my track work was printed on eight and a half by 11 sheets. So I had an idea where to put my bench work. Um, again, all done with one by fours. So, uh, so that's my bench work and that's my staging right here. So that's, that's it for my bench work. So that's another plus to using a pre-planned software is uh, you can print everything out to one-to-one -one scale. Yeah, that, that made it easy for me when, especially if I go back to, um, sorry. So here, you can see here at the end where I've got my peninsula. So I've got all my paper track plan. Uh, so I'm able to make sure that um, the um, the cross pieces would be under and make sure that it's not under a switch because I was going to use tortoises. And uh, unfortunately, there's one place I have to uh, take apart, but uh, the rest is okay. <laughs> well, that's it for my bench work. I'm not seeing any... Uh... Anything in the chat for you specifically, Lloyd, at this point? Um, but at that, we're going to uh, go ahead and open it up to general show Q&A. So if you guys got anything, uh, questions for anybody specifically or just in general, go ahead. Now's the time to throw them up. Um, we do have one here for Andy. Uh, Andy, how did you decide to build so close to the ceiling? I feel like the room would make me claustrophobic. Oh, oh well. Well... Okay, so I have a, a, a couch or um, whatever, a little love seat or whatever. I hate love seats, and they're kind of useless for most other purposes. So the love seat's in here. It's under the layout. With the top of the layout or the bottom of the lower level of the layout being um, where it is, I can sit down or the wife can come in and, and sit down. And, I mean, you have like 50 inches. So, I mean, a child or, or, or somebody could walk in this room and run around underneath the layout like it's a completely open room. So when you're standing in front of the layout at eye level, as soon as you duck down a little bit, you can walk anywhere in the room, just walk straight under everything, short of the couch being in the way. So, I mean, honestly, it feels extremely open because so much of the layout's open and it's not because, you know, it's not down at, you know, at, at mid level height. Now, I did and have planned and haven't shown that to any of you guys, but have planned a couple lower levels in the event that um, that I end up staying, that the layout stays in this room for a long time. I do plan on on building a new home in a few years or uh, depending <coughs> the economy, um, getting a 40 by 16 building and relocating these modules out there. That's why I planned the spacing of the gaps the way I did so that I could easily expand the layout, not just additive, but actually stretch it and expand it so so I can do what Tim was talking about. Trade link matters a lot to me. And I'm stuck running 26, 28 car trades, and I'd like to run 40 or so. So I can extend it. But but I wanted the layout at eye level for absolute sure. I love that look. I love being able to see the detail. And the top level, you don't have to interact with it. You don't have to get up and uncouple very much. This one spot, I've actually built a raised floor section right here. So you can uncouple at this one branch line. The rest of it is just standing back, looking up, and watching the pushers do their job. And if you look at any of the pictures of this line, and I grew up, uh, you know, occasionally in Virginia riding along the road, and the trains are way up on the side of the mountains. So it reminds me of driving down that line as a young kid and looking up and seeing the trains go across those 100-foot-tall steel trestles, steel viaducts. So it's not right for everybody. I get that. It's a special use case for me. I love it, though. Uh, so, Cooltropolis wants to know. Uh, so, what's your plan for shrinkage, Andy? Foam shrinkage. It uh, it happens. Uh, so, what? I don't put the track directly on the foam. We'll talk about that uh, in a couple weeks when we talk about roadbed, subroadbed. 
Um, I, I don't choose to do that for a host of reasons. But so what I've done, and I have seen that shrinkage over the five years. So, so far, I have not seen the gaps because I have taken the modules down to put the backdrop up. I still need to put the photos up. So my modules are still takeable, downable. Um, if you guys will let me away with that linguistic mess. Um, so right now they are. But what my plan has always been is I'm going to take a piece of that uh, self-adhesive mesh drywall tape and make a little roll out of it, stick it down in those gaps. So I intentionally left a little bit of a gap between the modules. It has grown to probably three-eighths of an inch, give or take, but I'm going to stick that tape down in there and run over it with my ground goop, which can expand and contract some without breaking. If it does break, I'll fill the little gap. If it ex if it shrinks any more, I would say it's probably shrunk as much as it is going to, but I'll fill those gaps with the ground goop, and if and when I move these modules in the future, I just take my... The only tool required, while I was talking about all the tools that, that I do have access to and I use occasionally, the only tool required to build my layout is a knife. <laughs> With this technique, a measuring tape is handy, not required. That's the only tool you need to build this whole layout. I mean, the, the bench work and the framework, that is. Well, you need a screw gun. Well, or a Phillips screwdriver and, you know, and a Phillips screwdriver and some elbow grease, you know. But, yes, everybody needs a cordless drill anyway. That's that's just a good idea. We did have a question or kind of a question slash comment earlier on by um, why are you naked uh, about no right or wrong way to build a layout. We've yeah, discussed yeah. some of our other shows. There are some wrong ways to build a layout, but there are so many right ways, and it, it generally boils down to what works and what does not work for you. And yeah. I think that's kind of our whole point of our of this show is to show you what works for us, and then you can decide what will work for you when you go to build your layout. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, I think it's Chris from um, uh, what is it? Cool uh, Metropolis. Cool Metropolis. Yeah, I know that when you build this layout, it, there's a lot of two by fours, uh, and it's definitely cheaper then getting a one by four and pine eight feet long you're talking about well in canadian dollars eight nine bucks per per piece and a two by four you can get a lot of them <clears throat> so uh and if you have plenty of two by fours in your in your garage i mean you use whatever your what's available and what's cheaper and what works for you but if you're talking about cost too, the part of this, um, you know, I wanted to spend well, it's it's time, you know, the things that we have that you need to build a railroad are time, money, and skill. And you need the time and the money to develop that skill. They're all they all work together. But I didn't have a, a whole lot of free time and I wanted to do the stuff that was that was interesting uh, and fun. So I just got busy doing that. But as a side effect, it's incredibly cheap to build the way that I've built. At one time, I'd calculated what I had in the whole layout and, uh, you know, separating the structures uh, and any kits I, I, I bought there, separating DCC and all that stuff. But, you know, you could argue one way or the other, but separating structures, DCC and equipment. I had way less than a thousand bucks in this whole thing, and including tools, tools and building layout, way less than a thousand bucks. At this point, I've bought 3D printers and other things that aren't related to the railroad and locomotives and equipment, but just styrofoam and trackage. At Homosote, I, I still couldn't be much more than a thousand bucks in the whole thing. But also, the other thing on the one by threes or the one by fours, they're they're thin enough, and usually if they got a little bit of twist or or bow in them, you could actually work that out of them. You get a bow or a twist in a two by four, it takes quite a bit to try to work that out of. But they're going to twist. You know, yeah. think about. I've been trying to explain this to people before too. The closer to square that you are with wood, the more twisting it is. If you've ever seen somebody who put up a, a porch and didn't finish the top for a while and set log four by fours up that were unsupported, they turn, turn, you know, they spiral. They turn right circular if they're unsupported. Two by fours in a wall are supported top and bottom. That keeps them from twisting. And they're supported on both sides most of the time, at least one side. But they'll often twist if they're only supported on one side. But you need at least sheetrock or, or something like that to keep them from wanting to twist. The closer to as long of a, of a rectangle 
of a structure as you could get a one by four or something like that, the better it's going to, the less likely it is going to twist. Well, they're also lighter weight. And cheaper and easier to work with. It's basically and, every advantage of the world. Uh, I'm curious about the, you know, uh, Lloyd, you've used L girder, right? Yep. And have you, and see, that gives you the benefit of like that tortoise. You could go back and move the brackets. There is a distinct benefit. And I know you've done it right because I followed along with your layout construction, of course, for several years. What I've seen a whole lot of people doing building L girder is they build L girder and they glue and screw those top uh, laterals down. You lose the flexibility of being able to move the, the top girders. L girder is great if you use it the way that Lynn Westcott had originally decided it to be used, and I know you have. And that's the beauty of that system is being able to move it. It does have the compromise of being quite thick. And for a single level layout, boy, it's hard to go wrong with L girder. It really is. For a multi level layout, it gets to be challenging because you end up with an eight inch deep deck, not counting scenery and anything. So. <laughs> Well, Robert. All right. <clears throat> by a few announcements. We had some announcements for the next show. Well, also for questions, um, you know, by all means, uh, leave us questions or, um, you know, you can talk to us in our nightly chats and, and we'll keep them down if you want them to address them on the next show. Of course, you could comment on this YouTube video if you're watching it after the fact. But we've also set up an email address. So you can email us at empires, with an S, E-M-P-I-R-E-S, at modelrarityglive.com. That's empires at modelrarityglive.com. And we'll, if it's questions about this show after the fact or something you thought about or something we all, or a comment that you'd like to, to add that, you know, that, that would be good for the community to understand. Please send us an email there or message us with any of the other mechanisms that you can communicate with us on. Uh, I think we even have a carrier pigeon wrangler. So whatever you can do to get to us, uh, thank you for posting that in the chat, Tim. We'll also add it to the comments uh, under this video. So give us an email if you'd like to have us address or answer any questions about our labs. Um, upcoming shows. Yeah, upcoming shows or any other MRL. We do, of course. To, to so, of course, on. this show goes on every two weeks on Saturday. Same bat time, same bat channel. I hope that's not copyrighted. Um, you know, next week we're going to take the, the bench work and go up above that. So we're going to talk about the subroad bed and road bed uh, solutions. And uh, I think that's going to be incredibly interesting because we've all used some fairly, you know, we've debated and discussed about the different options. Uh for how we've supported that road bed from foam to wood to, to various road beds on top of that. So that will be uh, two weeks from today on Saturday. We'll have that posted um, uh, on the 30th. That's right. On the 30th of this month, um, we'll have that show. Uh, we also have all of our shows posted on the calendar, uh, www.modelrailroadinglive.com. You can click on the, on the calendar link that's there and get a list of every show we have. Or in the comments to this video, uh, there are also the links to the page about Railroad Empires on the, the, the show page on www.modelrailroadinglive.com, the Railroad Empires dedicated show uh, or page there. And it will have the calendar uh, upcoming shows and what each of those are like are going to be about. You can follow along with us there. Um, of course, we, we will have uh, uh, Thursday, Johnny show next Thursday. Uh, we had, Johnny had a really busy week this past week with four shows put on. So uh, we'll see you guys again for that show on Thursday. And, uh, and Big Bill's got a show coming up again before we appear again. Um, on May 27th, we've got a, a uh, Who's Big Bill talking to. Of course, we all look forward to those. We'll see you there for the 27th. So see you guys again in two weeks or on Johnny's show this upcoming Thursday. Again, we want, to, we want to thank everybody for, for tuning in and watching the show. And appreciate you guys, and we'll catch you again in two weeks. That's right. Good, good night. Good night, everybody.